Hello everybody from the club office in Biersfelden. Thank you for inviting me to speak at the Forbes Women's Summit. Before we dive into the workplace post-pandemic, let me introduce Vitra. At Vitra, we believe that our surroundings shape the way we think and feel every moment of the day, and we work on improving these environments through the power of good design. Our products are present in workspaces, homes and public places such as airports or restaurants worldwide. We're a design company that serves a broad spectrum of needs, functions and aesthetics with classics and contemporary objects. We're also a family company founded by my grandparents and now run in the third generation. My name is Nora Fellbaum. I am CEO, member of the board and representative of the family my sisters and cousins, all women, in the company. We have a history of female leadership at Vitra. My grandmother, Erika, and Willy founded the company together in the 1930s. On his first trip to the United States, Willy Fehlbaum discovered the shell chair by Charles and Ray Eames in a shop window in the US. And seeing the innovative character, began fighting for the rights to produce this chair in Europe. Ever since 1956, we have been doing so on the Vitra campus in Weil am Rhein in Germany. In the 1960s, the first chair developed by Vitra, the Panton chair, was revealed and in the late 1970s, the company began investigating the world of work. The second generation of the family had taken over and gave Vitra a cultural mission that went beyond purely commercial ambitions. The Vitra Design Museum was founded, the Vitra campus with its architecture and collections came to be. As the third generation, we're following an environmental mission with the company. As a result, a garden has been planted on the site just this year. So come visit us, but this is a topic for another presentation. Today, we're not here to speak about gardens, but about the workplace. To understand the impact of the global pandemic on our work environments, we travel back in time and examine the last 150 years of office history. In 1850, the few clerical workers the economy required at the time worked from their patrons' homes. Seated in rooms that appeared like private libraries, they began to dress up in more formal attire, the frocks and white shirts that we for many decades considered business wear until sweatpants and hoodies became equally acceptable. A decade later, the first office chair with a mechanism was invented to make the long hours spent sitting more bearable. In the 1870s, the light bulb was invented, as was the telephone. Both would eventually lead to a fundamental change in how and when work was done. With the telephone, information could now be quickly exchanged. With the invention of the light bulb, working hours suddenly became independent of daylight. First, underground train lines were built in the 1860s, allowing for commutes of more workers to central office buildings that began to house hundreds, then thousands of people. Decades later, Frank Lloyd Wright developed buildings that were built based on Tayloristic ideals of productive work, with daylight, high ceilings, large open rooms housing many workers in rows of desks, and a mezzanine allowing for their supervisors constant and quite literal top-down oversight. During the Second World War, the Joint Chiefs of Staff surrounded themselves in the White House pre Presidential War Situation Room with its large screens, charts and all other relevant information on the walls, thereby foreshadowing in a way future means of communication and interaction in corporate conference rooms all over the world. In the decades that followed, the personal computer became the main work instrument for exploding numbers of administrative workers. The cubicle was invented to efficiently house these workers for optimized productivity and minimal disturbance. Popular culture with films such as Office Space began to depict this modern office as a monotonous, inhumane and somewhat isolating environment. The invention of the laptop and later the mobile phone allowed a new office concept to emerge, activity-based working. It understood that different activities take place in a modern office and that workers would move around freely and spontaneously in their work environment using different spaces and furniture typologies for different tasks. 
In the 2000s, large corporates began to build campus environments for their workers, such as Facebook that is depicted here. And that's just one example. A broad range of amenities were offered and home furniture, such as sofas, entered offices, making staying at work convenient and comfortable. Corporate culture bound employees to the workplace for long hours during the week, even though the invention of the iPhone, ubiquitous wireless connections and working without paper or files allowed for mobile work literally from everywhere. The combination of mobile technology and the rise of the freelance economy in the 2010s eventually led to the development of shared workspaces. That was the state of the office when in early 2020, a deadly virus started spreading from Wuhan, China across the globe, forcing many countries into lockdown and bringing all public life and economic activity to a halt. The global health crisis acted as an accelerator for developments that had already been swelling. The increasingly dense workspaces where teams were crammed together in order to maximize productivity of very expensive real estate became unsafe. Our lifestyle of mindless, exhausting travel for short meetings or to large fairs and conferences had to stop with these events being canceled. Millions of office workers and thousands of companies were forced into an experiment of remote working that, for the most part, and somewhat surprisingly, turned out to be successful, at least on the short term. The technology to work remotely from our homes or elsewhere had been around for a while and allowed for an almost uninterrupted continuation of collaboration. The companies that had been careful to avoid the topic of working from home suddenly had to ask their staff to work from home. Workers were freed from grueling commutes, from fixed working hours and travel schedules that affected both humans and the environment. The pandemic of 2020 was an accelerator that resulted in a fundamental transformation of how and where white collar work is done. As with any true transformation, there is no looking back. The lockdown and enforced home working phase of the pandemic may be over, but the struggle that many companies face over if and how to bring their staff back in the office demonstrates that there is a larger change at play. The insight that some administrative, mostly individual work can be done remotely for some time comes at a time when a generational shift is also ongoing. Millennials are now making up the majority of the workforce, and Gen Z is entering it. In this world, the free-spirited worker post-pandemic nests in her active, multifunctional home for hours of focus. She productively works while on the road, she delivers projects while enjoying time in nature or abroad. From time to time, often a few days a week, she spends time in the office. Now, how to coordinate this free-spirited return to the office? That's the question that many of our clients are facing and that we ourselves had to answer for the Vitra team. Throughout this time, companies have made announcements about how and when they will expect their teams back in the office. Often external circumstances, such as a new variant, then upended these plans or they were simply not seen through. A recent survey showed that while the business attire and general distraction was not missed while working from home, especially the younger generations and newer members of a team missed the social aspects of work, collaboration and even the commute, which brought a much needed distance between work and home life. So what did this mean for us at Vitra? Before the pandemic, we frankly were not really open for much remote work and had to shift our attitude during the lockdown quite quickly. Now we find ourselves in what we call distributed work. We don't really want to be remote from each other at Vitra. And we have organized ourselves accordingly. Firstly, it is clear to everyone on the team that we are office first. We believe in the workplace as the central place for collaboration and where the culture of our company comes to life. Based on this, we built a simple framework with four work types. The workplace resident is 100% in the office. She can only get her work done if she is physically present, such as in production. The workplace enthusiast is mostly in the office, but might be out one or two days a week. The workplace citizen is up to 50% remote, but still spends the majority of the time in the office. 
The nomad lives far from their team and only comes in sporadically, on a visit. You will notice that there is no work type between 50% and 100% remote. We felt that this would be too disruptive for the rest of the team. In the meantime, in individual talks between team leader, employees and HR, each team member has been assigned a work type. And since September 1st, we're fully back in the office and are now living these work types. Now, what did this new way of working mean for our work environments? Let's go back to our free-spirited worker who comes into the workplace several days a week. There she breathes in her company's identity and culture and senses that she belongs to its broader community. She connects with the like-minded, valued people in her team, a team that she shares a common purpose with. Just like members of a club, like a debate club, a chess club or a rowing club, they get together voluntarily and on their own schedule, collaborating, sharing ideas and building up energy for a larger goal. They consciously leave the isolation of their home office behind them when obstacles need to be overcome or progress needs to be celebrated. The club office is the home of an organization, a tangible, authentic and unique representation of its identity and a place of belonging. In the club, the company hosts its community, its members, customers and partners. Their rituals are linked to this place. Memories and experiences are rooted here. In the club, friendships and human connections are formed. During the pandemic, companies were able to rely on a social codex that has grown among its team through close collaboration of many, many years. This social codex comes to life in the club and will allow the company to weather the storms of the future. New members are easily onboarded here. They begin to understand the company culture, build a network and start sharing the common purpose with their team. They avoid the early fluctuation and loss of meaning that we have seen while working remotely. So let's have a look at the club. The club office concept, like the work types, is quite simple. It consists of three areas. The public area of the club is joyful, warm and welcoming. The club's interiors enable conversation, interaction and informal collaboration. Every seat can turn into a productive workstation or a place of exchange. The club includes public and open spaces for hospitality, along with spaces to debate, collaborate informally, such as in um, Alcove Plus or around a soft work huddle. In the semi-public, back of the club, team members find themselves in more formal collaboration spaces, such as learning environments. They hold workshops there in flexible and dynamic collaboration spaces of different sizes. Most of them are rather informal and easily adapted to the needs of that day. The teams might build their space for solving the problem of the day or for a few weeks at a time if working against a tough deadline. The third area of the club is private. It is dedicated to individual focus work, the type of task that can be easily done from home. So the club office concept includes the home office as one option. Members of the club send signals with where they spend their time. In the public area, they're open for exchange and unexpected meetings. In the semi-public area, they meet consciously and formally to work against the goal. They retreat in the private area or their home when they need to work individually. Nice concept, you might think. And until recently, the club office was just that, a concept. At Witra, we have a culture of trial and error. We knew that we needed to build a club quickly and test our ideas. Christian Grosen joined Vitra as Chief of Design in June 2020. Here he is working with Pirjo, who leads our consulting and planning studio. He wanted to make quick progress, rally his team around him and change their work culture, a desire he shares with many of our clients. This made him and his team the perfect testing ground for the club, which has been opened over the summer here in our main office near Basel, Switzerland. The club represents the culture that the company is looking to build the home of a winning team that its existing and future members want to be a part of. What we're sharing today is the Vitra Club. Your club will likely look and feel quite different. Hopefully, I was able to raise your curiosity and maybe even interest you in a visit. Get in touch with me. We look forward to hosting many powerful women here soon. And while you're here, you might be interested in seeing the Women in Design exhibition at the Vitra Design Museum, which runs until the beginning of March. Bye and take care.